I want to talk about um, using share of search as an advertising metric. In part one, we talked about using it as a brand metric. Now I'd like to talk about using it as an advertising metric. Now, those of you who are familiar with advertising evaluation will already recognize that the relationship between share of search and share of market looks astonishingly similar to relation, the relationship between share of market and share of voice. Um, we know from decades worth of research that share of voice is a really important influence on market share um, in most categories. So um, I think the first research that I've heard of in this area was done in the 1960s. I'm told that Unilever did work on this in the 1960s that they, um, that they kept secret. Um, the um, uh, first public research on this was done in the 1970s by um, a guy called Peckham. Uh, it was originally called Peckham's Rule. Then Professor John Philip Jones published a massive study looking at 2,300 brands, which he published in uh, 1989, I think, um, in the Harvard Business Review. Um, and then many other Johnny Come Latelys, such as Les Binet and Peter Field, have um, uh, replicated this sort of research over the decades since, um, including, in fact, some work by uh, the Ehrenberg Bass people uh, in recent years. Um, what all of these researchers have found is this, that for any brand in any category, typically uh, there's a relationship between share of voice, which is share, typically share of advertising expenditure. Um, you can sometimes uh, produce share of voice metrics based on exposure, but usually it's spend and share of market. And um, there's a there's a sort of equilibrium line where share of voice and share of market are typically roughly equal to one another. And those brands are stable. Brands that set their share of voice above their share of market tend to grow. And brands that set, set their share of voice below their share of market tend to shrink. And that the rate at which a brand grows or shrinks tends to be proportional to share of voice minus share of market, what we call the extra share of voice, the gap between share of voice and share of market. So already you should hopefully see that this is rather similar to the relationship that I showed in the first part between, between share of search and share of market. So um, we know that share of voice of share affects share of market and we think that share of search is a leading indicator for share of market so does share of voice also affect share of searches um, and the answer is yes it does seem to so um, this is our data for the energy market for example so here are this is the pooled data that i was talking about earlier on um, each dot here represents one energy brand in one quarter over our sample. So again, we have this uh, massive sample with, um, I think here we've got something like about 40 years worth of data effectively um, in this chart. And what we can see is that there's a strong correlation between a brand's share of voice on the x-axis and its share of market on the y-axis. It's a very strong correlation. We see the same in all three categories, highly statistically significant, uh, greater than 99% confidence. But as before, that correlation is in itself is not that interesting, you know, because big brands typically have big budgets and therefore they're likely to have share of voice. What is really interesting is the dynamic relationship. What we see is that when a brand's share of voice goes up, its share of market tends to go up um, and that is much more likely to be a causal relationship because of obviously um, share of voice can affect share of market movements in share of voice can affect share of market but not the other way around um, uh, you, you know you can't advertising budgets are determined way in advance of sales um, so here's another one of those um, correlation dynamic correlation charts again i've done the same thing as before group the data by deciles to make the uh, correlations visually more uh, apparent. So each dot represents 10% of the sample. Bottom left are the 10% of the sample which had the biggest drop in share of voice. Bottom, top right are the 
10% of the sample with the biggest increase in share of voice. And what you can see is this really strong correlation between movements in share of voice and movements in market share. That's for cars. Um, we see the same in mobile. We see the same in energy. Um, really strong correlation between how a brand's advertising share of voice moves and how its share of market um, uh, responds. Um, and the correlations are similar in, in each category, but also the relationship, the slope of the line is remarkably similar in each category. So what we find is in cars, a 10% increase in share of voice, 10% extra share of voice, increases share of search um, in the short term by 0.36 percentage points. Um, in energy, it's 0.38 percentage points. In mobile, it's 0.43 percentage points. The differences between those figures are not statistically significant. Basically, what we can say is in each category, 10% extra share of voice immediately increases share of search by 0.4 percentage points. Um, I find that, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of a data geek. I find that remarkable that the response is so similar in these three quite different categories. What is also interesting is that this is rather similar, at least in terms of orders of magnitude, to the results you get from conventional share of voice analysis. So, um, for example, uh, the work that Peter Field and I have done with the IPA data bank gives us um, average measures for how market share responds to share of voice for different categories. Um, here's the data that, that, that was presented in our most recent book, Effectiveness in Context. So we can see, for example, for FMCG, a 10% increase in share of voice in FMCG typically leads to a 0.3% increase in market share. For durables, it's 0.6. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of variation by category. And the estimates that we're getting here from our share of search analysis fall pretty much in the middle of that range. So at least in terms of order of magnitude, the way that share of search responds to share of voice seems to be very similar to the way share of market responds to share of voice. Um, I think that's quite an interesting sort of corroboration, if you like. Um, now, the other thing that we did, so what I did with, with, with each of these three categories was again to use econometrics to build these pooled regression models, which show, use all of the, um, you know, the 300 years worth of data that we have at our disposal to measure the effects of advertising on the share of search in those categories. And we found that in each category, there was a short-term and a long-term effect. So if you have a burst of share of voice um, in, for example, the car market, you get an immediate spike in uh, share of search shown here in orange. So you do a burst of advertising and, and a bunch of people immediately respond by Googling the brand in question. But that short term spike decays away very quickly within a month. Um, but there's also a long tail of search, Google search queries, which last long after the original exposure and they decay away much more slowly. So there's the big short term effect, but there's also this, this much smaller long term effect, which decays away very slowly. Um, now, I find that very interesting. I think that's um, potentially picking up two ways in which advertising affects search behavior. For some people, it's hitting people who are interested right now, probably people who are interested in the who are, who are in the market, interested in buying. Those people respond very quickly, um, but they 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 move out of the market very quickly. But there's also a long tail of, of people who are who see the ads. And then they maybe go on to Google the brand sometime over the next year or so. This is a kind of longer term um, relating to longer term memories of the advertising. Anyone who's familiar with my previous research in how advertising works will know why I'm interested in this, because um, Peter Field and I over the last 
uh, 14 years or so. All our work that we've done with the IPA data bank has pointed us in this direction, that advertising has two effects, short-term effects and long-term effects. Big short-term effects, which decay away very quickly, smaller long-term effects, which decay away very slowly. We call these big short-term effects sales activation. We call these longer-term effects brand building. Um, now, the search models allow us to interrogate the way these effects build and decay, at least in these three categories. And they tell you something about how long they last. So what we see is that um, in energy, the total effect of advertising, you know, that long tail of searches goes on for eight, 18 months or so. 95% of the searches generated come through within 18 months. Um, in cars, it lasts longer. Um, you know, the searches are still coming through 21 months after after exposure to the advertising. In mobile, even longer. We see that um, some people are searching um, 39 months after the ads have been on air. On average, we're sort of talking about 26 months. This this idea is basically that, that advertising is still influencing people's online behavior about two years after people are exposed to it. Now, most people who work in digital marketing, marketing, people who tend to work in search, don't think about advertising operating over these timescales, I think, I believe. Um, I, when I've talked to people who work in search marketing and in digital marketing, they're very much more focused on the short term, on, you know, like timescales of the order of a week. The idea that digital marketing might operate over timescales of two years, I think is quite foreign to many people who, who focus on short-term performance marketing. Um, I think it's a real eye-opener. I think this is helps point us back in the direction of long-term metrics and long-term advertising effects. The other thing to think about here is, is, is this long-term multiplier. I mean, if you go back to that chart, Yes, there's a big short term effect, but most of the of, of the of the searches come through in this or a lot of the searches come through in this long tail the, shown in blue. And what our models tell us is that the long term total num volume of searches is much bigger than the immediate short term response, typically about two to three times bigger. So there's a long-term multiplier. The long-term effects of advertising seem to be two to three times bigger than the short-term effects. And again, that's consistent with what we see from other forms of research. This idea of a long-term multiplier is well known in advertising research. Typically, you'll tend to find people quote, a, you know, a multiplier of about Two, you know, the long term effects are about double the short term effects. Um, but it has been investigated in more detail. Most recent one that, um, that I've looked at um, in detail is work done by uh, people working with Nielsen data in 2015, a big meta analysis published in the Journal of Advertising Research, which showed that the long term multiplier is often typically between two and three. Um, so, for example, here you can see that um, the line here that on the right hand side is um, a soft drink um, where the multiplier was about two and a half. Um, so um, but as you can see that the, the multipliers vary a lot all the way up to sort of around 3.5. Similar order of magnitude to the sort of multipliers that we're seeing here from our search data. Um, uh, what you may also see uh, if you look at the kinds of brands in this 2015 study is they're very skewed towards FMCG with shorter purchase cycles, which might expl explain why the numbers in my table here are at the top end of the numbers shown in the study here. So again, I think broadly consistent with other research. Now what the um, uh, share of search models that, that I created with my 300 years worth of data tell us is that when you have repeated bursts of advertising, repeated bursts of share of voice, then those long-term effects accumulate over time. So this shows the effect of uh, 
five bursts of advertising in the short and the long term. So you get five spikes in search from those short term effects, but also the longer term effects accumulate, raising the base level of search over time. And those of you who've done econometric modeling or have seen econometric modeling on sales will know that increasingly econometricians are building these kinds of things into their models and that they're finding these sorts of long-term effects. This is a real example from one of the brands that we work with um, uh, relatively recently, a simulation showing um, the effects of advertising, six bursts of advertising on this brand's sales over time between 2015 and 2019. Um, each of the six bursts of advertising produces a short-term spike in sales, shown in red, but each burst of advertising also raises the base levels of sales over the longer term, and those longer term effects are shown in yellow. In this particular graph, about 60% of the sales generated from advertising come from the long term effects and about 40% from the short term. That 60-40 ratio comes up in a, in a lot of these sorts of models. Um, and guess what? It comes up in these search models as well. So if you look at how much of the effect of advertising on search comes from the short term spikes and how much comes from the long term build, then in energy, it's 70, 30, long term to short term. In cars, it's 64, 36. In mobile, it's about 60, 40. So on average, 65, 35 across these three categories. Um, obviously, when I saw these numbers, I got very excited because I've spent a lot of time talking about this 60-40 ratio in different forms. Maybe this explains what we call the 60-40 rule. Anyone who has read the books that I published with Peter Field in the last few years will show that will know that we've argued that for most brands in most categories, um, the optimum split of the communications budget is around 60% long-term brand building and about 40% short-term sales activation. 60% long-term, 40% short-term. In fact, our, our best reading of it um, across all B to C categories in recent years was 62.38. Um, so compare 62.38 against the average on the bottom of this chart, 65.35, those are not statistically different. There is a, a lot of variation by category. Some uh, categories require more brand building, some require more activation. So, so it's not surprising that there are variations in the ratio of short and long term between these three categories that we see here. But the order of magnitude is the same. So maybe this is part of the explanation of the 60-40 rule. Um, about 40% of the effect of advertising comes from short term prodding people to do something right now and about 60% comes from long-term increases in mental availability and you know consideration of the brand. Um, what our share of search models also tell us is it tell, they tell us what happens if you have sustained advertising. Um, one of the pushbacks that I've had about this zigzag chart, this famous chart that I've presented in various forms over the years is that I seem to be ad advocating um, bursts of advertising. No, I'm not. That's just a, a simulation of what would happen if you do bursts of advertising. Um, this simulation shows you what happens if you have sustained advertising for a brand. What happens is that you get build in the short term effects, you get build in the long term effects, but the main build comes from the, the long term effects in blue. And eventually what happens is that with sustained advertising, your share of search will stabilize eventually. Um, you get to an equilibrium where share of voice and share of search are in equilibrium. And, and eventually um, your share of market will also stabilize. Um, incidentally, the way that this builds to an equilibrium is somewhat reminiscent of, of the Bass diffusion model of growth, which I've talked about in other contexts, but I haven't really got time to talk about that today. Um, but each brand will have its own equilibrium level. Um, um, so if a brand has sustained 
advertising, then the level of share of voice will uh, help determine in the level of share of searches that that brand reaches. Each brand has its own equilibrium level. Um, if the brand, if share of voice is below that brand's equilibrium level, then the models tell us that share of search will tend to fall over the next two years. If a brand's share of voice is above the equilibrium level for that brand, its share of search will tend to rise over the next two years. Um, again, those of you who know your share of voice theory will say, well, this looks very like conventional share of voice theory, but there's a big difference. And that's the base level, because unlike conventional share of voice models, while the slopes of these equilibrium lines are similar, the base, var base levels vary a lot from brand, brand to brand. They are not zero. They are very different from zero. Um, that point might be lost on those of you who haven't done share of voice modeling, but it's a really big point for those of you who have. What it suggests possibly is that the conventional share of voice model that just assumes set your share of voice equal to your share of market is probably wrong. There's an equilibrium level of share of voice for your brand, and it may not be the same as your market share. Some brands can get away with a share of voice below their market share. Some brands can get away with, may need a share of voice above their market share. So looking at that base level is um, an interesting thing to do. This is what it looks like in mobile, mobile telephony, for example. What we find is that in mobile handsets, Apple has much, much higher base level of share of searches than any other brand. Even if Apple does no advertising at all, they'll still get lots of searches um, because there is such intrinsic interest and excitement about the Apple brand. And that comes from lots of things. It comes from the fact that they have a high consumer base, but also that they have fantastic products, fantastic design. Um, whereas, for example, um, a brand like Nokia has very much lower um, Share, base level of share of search these days so you know if you want to if you wanted to sort of relaunch the the nokia brand in today's market you'd have to work really really hard so i think this base level of share of searches is an interesting metric to look at and then that is in turn partly a reflection of the size of the customer base remember in part one i said there's this dual causality between share of search and share of market People search for the brands they already own or that they've already bought, but they also search for the brands that they might buy in the future. Um, now, I think comparing the base level of share of searches with the actual size of the customer base may tell us something about the underlying strength of the brand from things like um, product quality or perceived product quality, word of mouth and so on. Um, so if you look at a brand like, for example, um, Porsche, it has a high base level of share of searches compared to its, the size of its customer base, because this is a, a brand that people just loved to dream about and, and really are excited about, regardless of whether or not they're advertisers. So this actually is another way in which one can think about um, share of search as as if you like a brand strength metric. Um, so let me summarize what I've, I've said here about advertising, and then I'm gonna try and pull it all together. Um, the important thing to remember is that most searches are not driven by advertising. They're driven by other factors. So this base level of interest in a brand, um, I think mostly reflects the size of the customer base, but it also re reflects the underlying strength of the brand, its products, its services, its reputation, um, the excitement about the brand in society in general. Um, but what advertising can do is increase demand over and above that base level. And what we see is that advertising has both short and long term effects on search behavior. Those effects are remarkably similar across the brands and categories that we studied. They're remarkably consistent with other research on short and long-term advertising effects, which gives me a great deal of 
hope about this that that share of search really can be a research metric which is con consistent with other 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 bodies of research and what this research that i've done suggests is that share of voice is a key metric it's still a key metric mark ritson was slightly off the mark when he said that share of voice replaces share of search sorry that share of yeah that share of search replaces share of voice in fact you need both metrics you need share of voice as a marketing input and share of search as an inter intermediate response metric. Um, if you like, what share of voice is the thermostat and share of search is the thermometer. Um, and what we see is that the higher a brand share of voice, the, sh the higher share of its share of search will rise, other factors being equal. Um, we seem to see a similar response in the categories we studied a 10 percent burst of share of voice will increase share of searches by 0.4 percent roughly across the three categories um, it may be different in in some very different less responsive categories we'll find out um, and the, the short-term effect decays away very slowly but the short the longer term effect lasts about two years and again that's consistent with other forms of advertising research um, and that long-term effects are more than twice as important as short-term effects. Again, that seems to be consistent with other forms of research. And so that really does mean that um, it's important that we focus on the long-term effects of advertising as well as the short-term effects. And that when we're thinking about our advertising budgets and our advertising strategies, we pay perhaps twice as much attention to the long term as the, the as the short term, which is the rationale for the 60 40 rule. This idea that, you know, about 60 percent of your attention and effort should go into long term brand building and about 40 percent of your effort and attention and measurement should go into short term responses. Um, now I'm just going to try and pull the two parts together in a single slide. So. I can't prove this. This is a hypothesis, but this is my best guess at how all this works together. I think share of searches is a metric which really tracks something between mental availability and active consideration of a brand. It's a measure of how interested people are in a brand at some level before they actually come to buy. Most searches are not driven by advertising. For the most part, there's a base level of search behavior, which is completely unrelated to advertising. And most of that base level is to do with how big the brand is. Um, most searches are probably driven by existing customers um, uh, Googling the products that they've already bought or usually buy. However, there's also a lot of the base level is from people who are not currently customers of the brand, but who would like to be um, and who are not necessarily driven by advertising at all. I think that's a kind of measure of the intrinsic strength of a brand. It's the, the extent to which people who are not currently customers of the brand dream of being so, um, if you like. However, advertising can also get people interested in the brand over and above existing usage and intrinsic product driven uh, interest in the brand. And the key metric there is share of voice. Um, the extent to which you shout about your brand more than other people shout about their brands determines whether you get more than your fair share of searches in the category. And share of voice has both short and long-term effects on search behavior. Short-term searches are probably rela related to people who are currently interested in the category, thinking of buying about it, but buying the category. And what you've done is you've used advertising to kind of um, trigger them to Google you and maybe buy you right now. 
Long-term search behavior is probably uh, working down the brand route where share voice um, builds brand memories, feelings and associations, which um, make it more likely that you will Google that brand in any context over the next few years. And that's a proxy. Those those long term searches are, are if you like, a, a proxy for for long term mental availability of the brand. Um, share of searches is a leading indicator for market share, but it's not the only thing that affects market share. What we also need to think about is the conversion from search to sales. You know, there's many a slip between cup and lip, um, many a slip between that first speculative search about a brand and the brand you actually buy. This is the realm of Google's messy middle, as they call it. So, um, Yes, search, but share of searches might tell you which brands people are interested in at the top of the funnel, but um, performance marketing, direct marketing, customer service, physical availability, all these things um, affect conversion throughout the funnel. Um, one of the really important factors is pricing. So yes, you might want to buy a Porsche, but when you look at the prices, you'll find you can't afford, it, afford to do so. So price is a massive important, massively important factor for conversion. Um, another really important factor is physical availability. Just how easy is it from, for you to go from your desires and dreams to actual purchase behavior? If there's no shop that sells the product near you, if there's no dealership, if the website is just hard to find and hard to use, then you won't convert. So these other factors massively affect conversion from search to sales. And as I said in part one, studying the conversion from search to sales is quite an interesting way of both measuring underlying demand, measuring price sensitivity and tracking conversion. So share of searches and conversion then affect share of sales. And then of course, share of sales affects the size of the customer base and round we go. It's a cyclical um, dual causality model. It's um, Somebody said to me on Twitter the other day, share of searches versus share of market. It's not rocket science, is it? Well, actually, perhaps it is. It's not as straightforward as one might think, but I think we're making headway with producing some tools and some metrics for interrogating this slightly complicated um, relationship. And by the way, this map would, would um, you, could, you could take the word share of searches out of here and put brand consideration into that diagram and almost exactly the same thing would happen. This is why tracking metrics have never had a simple relationship between, um, between tracking and, and, and sales because tracking metrics themselves are also influenced by the size of the customer base, um, physical and, and mental availability and so on. Um, um, it's not straightforward, but um, we are producing some ways of looking at this data, which help you to find your way through this uh, messy middle. Um, I've talked about ESOS as a metric, which I think can help to, to kind of disentangle um, the, the the, the 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 relationship between share of searches and size of the customer base. I've talked about the conversion me metric, which you know allows you to interrogate how share of searches converts from to share of market and how that um, relates to things like relative price. Um, I talked about um, looking at ESOS over the longer term and how that compares with growth rates. Um, a simple graphical technique, which which is certainly useful in some categories. 